All right, so for the digestive tract, is also referred to as the GI tract or the alimentary canal, and it basically is one long tube that's going from the mouth to the anus, and then along the way we're going to have various structures that make up this tube, and then a variety of accessory structures. And when you look at this tube, you're going to have the mouth, and then you're going to go down into the pharynx, and you have the esophagus, the stomach, the small intestine, the large intestine. And then you're going to have a variety of accessory structures that are helping the processes that are taking place in this tube or in this alimentary canal. And those accessory structures are going to be the teeth, the tongue, the gallbladder, salivary glands, the liver, and the pancreas. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk in general about what happens in this tube. And then we're going to go step by step through this tube and talk about the different structures and say exactly what happens in those particular areas of the GI tract. And again, what structural characteristics do those areas have that allow that area to do a particular job? So when you look at the GI tract, basically what we want to do, we want to put food into this tract, propel that food in a forward direction, and then as that food is moving through, we want to break that food down. And we're first going to break it down mechanically. We're going to take that food and break it down into smaller and smaller pieces. And the reason for that is we want to get really small pieces so that we can then put enzymes into the mix, different fluids, mix everything up, and then let those enzymes go in and start cleaving the bonds that are holding these various nutrients together. So that by the time we get into the small intestine, we want to have all of these nutrients or these macromolecules broken down. So we want to take starch and we want to break it down into monosaccharides or things like glucose would be a monosaccharide, fructose. We want to take proteins, break those down into their building blocks or their amino acids. We want to take fats, break those down, or lipids, break those down into fatty acids and glycerol. And then once we have those small building blocks, now we've got structures that are small enough that we can transport them across the wall of the GI tract, across the wall of the small intestine, and then allow those things to get into the bloodstream. And then they'll travel through the bloodstream, and then they'll be used by various cells. But just taking a carbohydrate or a protein or a lipid, those things are too big to cross the wall of the small intestine and get into the blood. So we've got to break everything down and that's all going to take place in this GI tract. So the essential activities that we're going to do here, ingestion, we've got to get the food into our body, put it into our mouth, and then we have to propel it. We have to swallow it, and then we're going to have peristaltic contractions that are moving it in a forward direction. So propulsion is going to be both swallowing and then followed by involuntary peristaltic contractions. We're going to have mechanical digestion where we're breaking this food down into smaller pieces. Then we're going to chemically digest with enzymes. Once we get small enough particles, amino acids, monosaccharides, fatty acids, and glycerol, we can absorb those things. And then anything that's left over, we're going to defecate. Just get rid of whatever we're not going to utilize. Okay. So ingestion again, getting food into the body. Propulsion, swallowing, which we're going to see is going to have voluntary aspects to it and involuntary aspects. Once we get that food, in through the mouth, we're going to swallow it, getting it into the pharynx, and then into the esophagus. 
and then peristalsis will take over. Once we're in the stomach and moving it through the small intestine, large intestine, peristalsis will take over. Now, <coughs> peristalsis is where you have the smooth muscle that's in the walls of these various organs contracting, and they're gonna contract in a particular sequence. So this right here would be peristalsis. So what you've got here, you've got your bolus of food, or depending on where this is in the digestive tract, this might be chyme, which is a food that's been mixed with a lot of liquids or gastric juices. So it's a very liquid component. But you're gonna have some bolus here, and then you're gonna have the smooth muscle contracting behind that bolus, the smooth muscle relaxing in front of that bolus, and that's going to help to move that bolus in a forward direction. And then you'll keep having <coughs> waves of contraction behind it, relaxation in front of it, and that will move that bolus in a forward direction. That's peristalsis, okay? Involuntary because it's smooth muscle. And we'll see there's different mechanisms that are going to kick in to cause that smooth muscle to contract then we're gonna have mechanical digestion, and we can break up this food in a variety of ways mechanically. We can chew it, and then we can do mixing and churning. So our teeth are gonna help us to chew this food, breaking it down into smaller particles. And then once we get it into the GI tract, then we can have the smooth muscle contracting in this kind of fashion here <coughs> to cause that food, that bolus, to start to mix with all these juices and start to break it up. And this right here, this type of contractions is called segmentation. So again, it's going to be smooth <coughs> muscle of wherever we are. It might be the stomach, could be the small intestine. And here the contractions are going to happen um, kind of more frequently. And what it's going to do is it's going to break up that material. It's kind of like throwing your clothes in the washing machine and how it kind of jumbles everything together. That's what segmentation is going to be like. So it's going to help to mechanically digest this food, break it down into smaller pieces, and then help mix that food with all of these juices and all of these enzymes. Now, once we get those particles small enough, then we can do chemical digestion. <coughs> chemical digestion is where enzymes are going to come in and cleave the bonds that are holding these building blocks together. Okay. Then absorption, we're going to take these nutrients that are now small enough, move them across the wall of the GI tract, and they're going to enter into the bloodstream directly, or they're going to enter into the lymph, and then the lymph will drain into the blood. Now, things that are water-soluble, so things like monosaccharides, glucose, um, sodium, calcium, vitamins, mm, some of our, our water-soluble vitamins, those things are going to be able to enter the bloodstream directly because they can dissolve right in the blood because they're water-soluble. Things that aren't water-soluble are going to enter the lymph first. So this would be things like our fat-soluble vitamins and our fatty acids and glycerol. Because they're not water-soluble, if we stuck them right into the blood, they would just gunk everything up. So instead, they're going to go into the lymphatic system first, get paired up with various <coughs> proteins, so then they can enter the bloodstream and then travel through the blood without clogging everything up. Then anything that we're not going to digest, anything that's left over, defecation. Get rid of that um, waste material. Okay. Now, you are looking at the GI tract. In order to have the smooth muscle contract and set up peristalsis or set up segmentation, or to have various cells releasing um, digestive fluids or digestive enzymes. These areas need to be told that they have to do that. They're just not going to magically do these things. So in terms of regulating the processes of digestion, 
we're going to be activating or inhibiting various glands. These could be endocrine glands, they could be exocrine glands, they could be groups of endocrine cells, they can be groups of exocrine cells. And then the smooth muscle, mixing, segmentation, or moving the contents that's in the lumen. These areas have to be told to do this. So we're gonna see that there are gonna be a lot of reflexes that are set up. Reflexes like what we talked about with the nervous system that are set up to tell these cells, release your secretions, tell the smooth muscle, contract or relax. And there's gonna be a variety of things that are gonna trigger these reflexes. So remember, when we have a reflex, the very first part of a reflex is always activate a what? It's the very first thing. A receptor, right? Something has to detect. So we're gonna have a variety of receptors. We're gonna have stretch receptors that are gonna detect when, for example, food gets into the stomach, causes it to stretch. That can set up a reflex. We might have um, receptors that are detecting osmolarity. How concentrated is this, um, is this uh, digestive juice? Um, we might have various um, chemoreceptors. So various stimuli are going to trigger these reflexes. And then we can send that information up to a control center. And that control center can be in the central nervous system. So that would mean that our receptors are somewhere here in the digestive tract. Receptors get activated. We send the information along sensory neurons up to a control center in the central nervous system. Usually it's going to be the hypothalamus, not always, but usually when it has to do with the digestive tract. And then coming out of the hypothalamus or out of that control center, we're going to have either sympathetic or parasympathetic neurons. And if we're talking about digestion, activating digestion, more than likely it's going to be which type? Sympathetic or parasympathetic? Parasympathetic. And those nerves then would come down and either stimulate cells or glands to release their secretions, stimulate smooth muscle to contract or to relax. And when we look at those kind of reflexes, um, where the control center is in the central nervous system, those are called long reflexes. Now we mentioned also that the <coughs> nervous system has, or sorry, the digestive system has its own nervous system essentially. All they're contained in the digestive tract. So we can have control centers that are right there in the digestive tract so that we never need to send the information through the spinal cord and up to the brain. And those would be called short reflexes. So if we have the receptor right here in the digestive tract, if the control center is right there in the digestive tract and we activate neurons right there in the digestive tract, those would be short reflexes. And again, we can still stimulate glands to release their secretions, stimulate smooth muscle to contract. So we'll look at those when we get to the various areas. Okay, so in terms of looking at structures, like every system, we're going to see that there's connective tissue around these various organs. And the connective tissue that's going to line the abdominal cavity and also surround these organs is going to be a great big piece of tissue, a serous membrane called the peritoneum. And just like what we've seen in other areas, like around the heart, around the lungs, there's going to be two different layers of this great big serous membrane. The part of this connective tissue that surrounds the organ itself, that's called the visceral peritoneum. So when you look at the stomach, for example, the outermost part of the stomach is going to be connective tissue that surrounds it. That would be the visceral peritoneum. 
the part of this big piece of connective tissue that lines the abdominal cavity, that's called the parietal peritoneum. And because you don't want these two layers to rub against one another, you're always going to have a little bit of space between these two layers. That would be your peritoneal cavity. And this is going to help lubricate all these different organs so that they can slide past one another, not create a lot of friction, and still protecting all these various organs. Now, with these various digestive organs, we're also going to see that not only are they going to have connective tissue that surrounds them that are helping to protect the organ and help it slide past other organs, but we're also going to see that we're going to have mesentery. Mesentery is basically a double layer of that peritoneum. And what mesentery is going to do is it's going to help to connect all these various organs together. So we've got all these organs in the digestive tract. We want them to stay in a particular area, and the mesentery is going to help to hold all these different organs together. Also, in this mesentery, you're going to find lots of blood vessels that are routing through this mesentery to get to the different organs, as well as nerves that are going to be there also that are routing to these different organs. Now, some of these digestive organs are going to be inside of the, uh, let's see, it would be the ventral abdominal cavity, and so they would be inside of the peritoneum, and they're referred to as intraperitoneal organs. Some of these organs are actually going to sit slightly dorsal, slightly behind that peritoneum, and those are called your retroperitoneal organs. So for example, when you look at the pancreas, most of the pancreas and then parts of the small and large intestine the way they are kind of weaving in this area, some are going to sit more ventral and be in the peritoneum, and then sometimes they will be just dorsal to it and sit just outside of that peritoneum. So just be aware that you have retro, slightly outside, intra, inside of that peritoneum. Now, in terms of blood supply, so let's go over this briefly now, and then when we talk about the liver, we're going to come back and talk about this again. Now, when we talk about blood supply, almost every time that we talk about blood supply, we say that blood that's going to go into the systemic circuit leaves the left ventricle of the heart goes into the aorta, and then you're going to have branches coming off of the aorta. So you're going to have arteries branching off of the aorta, and then those arteries are going to branch into smaller but more numerous arteries until finally you get down to the level of arterioles. And arterioles would be the smallest of your arteries, and then that would take you into capillary beds. And this is where you can have nutrient and gas exchange, right? This is where glucose and amino acids and ions and vitamins and oxygen can come out of the blood and supply the cells that are around these capillary beds. And then waste products that these cells are producing and carbon dioxide can go into the bloodstream. And then we said as that blood leaves the capillary beds, it will go into a venule, the smallest of all the veins. Venules will converge onto larger but less numerous veins until finally we get back to the heart through the superior and inferior vena cava. Okay. So that's generally the flow of it. <coughs> now, here in the digestive tract, things are going to be a little bit different, kind of like we saw in the endocrine system between the 
hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary, there was a portal system up there. We're going to have a portal system associated with the digestive tract as well. So what we're going to have, we're going to have arteries coming off of the abdominal aorta. And we're going to have, for example, we'll have the hepatic artery coming off of the abdominal aorta. And this would send oxygen-rich blood, nutrient-rich blood, over to the liver so that the liver can get nutrients and get rid of their waste products. We'll have the splenic artery coming off of the abdominal aorta. We'll have the gastric arteries coming off. And these, sorry, and then also the inferior and superior mesenteric arteries. And that's all sending this nice oxygen-rich, nutrient-rich blood over to the spleen, the liver, the stomach, the small and large intestines. Okay. Now, here's where this portal system comes into play. Now, instead of all of that blood leaving these organs, and going into venules, and then going into veins, and then draining into the inferior vena cava. All of that blood that leaves these organs instead is gonna go over to the liver first. All of that blood's gonna go over to the liver so that the liver can detoxify anything that might have gotten absorbed in the digestive tract. So, what we're going to see here is we're going to have the liver. And the liver is going to receive blood from the hepatic artery. just like what you would expect an organ to do. Okay. So <coughs> blood's going to leave the left ventricle of the heart. We're going to go into the abdominal aorta. Right. Obviously, we're going to go into the aorta first, and then into the abdominal aorta. And one of the branches off of the abdominal aorta is the hepatic artery. And that's going to send oxygen and nutrient-rich blood here into the liver. Okay. And that hepatic artery, as it comes into the liver, it's going to branch until it eventually gets down to the level of arterioles and then gets down to the level of capillary beds. And that's how all the cells of the liver are going to get oxygen and nutrients, right? just like every other time that we talked about. Now, blood that leaves the liver is going to leave, again, at the level of capillary beds, that blood will drain into venules, those venules will drain into veins, and those veins in the liver will all drain into the hepatic vein. And the hepatic vein then drain into the inferior vena cava, and then eventually that blood will get back to the heart. So that's normal. That's like what we've said so far. But the liver is also going to receive blood from another place. The liver is also going to receive blood from the hepatic portal vein. This is the difference here. This is the whole portal system. So as blood is leaving all of these different GI organs, the stomach, the small intestine, the large intestine, the spleen, all of these different GI organs that we listed up here. As blood is leaving all these different organs, instead of the blood draining right into 
the inferior vena cava and going back to the heart, we're going to send all of that venous blood over here to the liver first. So as blood leaves these GI organs through their various veins, right? So blood's going to leave the stomach through the gastric vein. Blood's going to leave the intestines through the superior and inferior mesenteric veins, right? But instead of those veins all draining into the inferior <coughs> vena cava, they're all going to drain into the hepatic portal vein. So all of that venous blood leaving these GI organs is going to come over here to the liver. This hepatic portal vein, when it gets into the liver, it's going to branch and it's going to get down to a level where we can detoxify that blood. Now, the reason we do this is, let's say that you just ate a meal. You ate a meal, your GI tract has taken that food, broken it down into smaller and smaller pieces until eventually we got to amino acids and monosaccharides and fatty acids and glycerol. And then we absorb those nutrients across the wall of the GI tract. And most of that's happening in the small intestine. Now, that's great. We just absorbed all these nutrients. But what if there were some toxins in that food that we just ate? What if there were some bacteria that didn't get destroyed? Now, all of those things have just entered the bloodstream as well. And we don't want those things to go right from these GI organs where everything got absorbed into the veins and then come right back here into the inferior vena cava, come right to the heart, then get sent out again to all the cells of the body. We could be spreading those toxins everywhere. So we're going to take that blood that's leaving these GI organs and anything that got absorbed across the wall of those GI organs and entered into the bloodstream, we're going to send it all over here to the liver first via the hepatic portal vein. And we're going to detoxify all of that blood. So that if we absorb some pathogens, or if we absorb some toxins, hopefully the liver is going to get rid of whatever got in there that we don't want before we then send it into the hepatic vein, into the inferior vena cava, back to the heart, and then out through the body. So, Anything leaving the blood, sorry, anything leaving the GI organs is not going to go right into the inferior vena cava and back to the heart. It's going to go over to the hepatic portal vein, go to the liver first, get detoxified. Then that blood can mix with the blood that's leaving the liver anyway. All mix in there together. Hopefully now that's all nice, clean blood and now it can go back to the heart and then out through the rest of the body. We'll come back when we talk about the liver. We'll look at this in more detail. So, hepatic portal vein is different from the hepatic artery, is different from the hepatic vein. The hepatic portal vein is going to be carrying oxygen or blood, but if we just ate a meal, this could be nutrient-rich blood. It needs detoxifying. Okay, so now what we're going to do is <clears throat> We're going to look at the wall of the GI tract. And this is going to be important when you guys are doing your histology. So when you look at the wall of the GI tract, and again, basically it's just one big tube that's going to have various structural adaptations along the way that allow particular functions to occur. But when you look, when you look at the GI tract, 
from the esophagus down to the anus, you're going to see that there are basically four glorified layers. We're not going to call them layers, we're going to call them tunics because they're kind of glorified layers. So basically four tunics are four super duper layers that are running the whole length of this tube. Again, from the esophagus down to the anus, these four layers are going to be consistent all the way down. And these four tunics are going to have particular functions. And again, depending on where <coughs> we're looking at this tunic, it will have various adaptations. So when we look at the different tunics in the stomach, they might have slight adaptations that are different from those in the small intestine. And that allows the stomach to do a particular function that the small intestine doesn't do. Now these four tunics, if you look from the lumen outward, okay, so if you're looking at, let's say, you're looking at the esophagus like this, okay, the area where the food is traveling through, that area is called the lumen. Okay? So if you were looking at blood vessels, where the blood is running through, that's the lumen. Okay? So in the GI tract where the food is traveling, that's the lumen. So if you look from the lumen out, you have the mucosal tunic, would be the innermost tunic. Then you're going to have the submucosa. Then you have the muscularis externa. And then the outermost part, which is basically just the connective tissue that surrounds that organ, that's the serosa. And again, if you look at these tunics, then you're going to see the mucosa running all the way from the esophagus all the way down to the anus. And then next, the submucosa is going to run all the way down. And the muscularis externa all the way down. And then the serosa all the way down. Now, when you guys are doing your histology, whatever slide that you're looking at, if you're looking at the esophagus or the stomach or the small intestine, you want to be able to see these four tunics in every slide. So if I put a pointer at one of them, you can say, that's the mucosal tunic, that's the submucosa, that's the muscularis externa, that's the <coughs> serosa. Now again, each tunic is going to have certain types of tissue in there that's going to help you identify what tunic you're looking at. And then there'll be certain adaptations that allows that particular area to do a particular function. So right now we're just going to talk about these tunics in general. So the mucosal tunic, this is the innermost tunic. And here, since it is the innermost tunic, you're definitely going to find what kind of cells at the innermost part of this tunic. What kind? Epithelial cells, okay, because it's lining a passageway. So in the mucosal tunic, the innermost part of the mucosal tunic, you always see a layer of epithelial cells. Now, what kind of epithelial cells might help you to determine what part of the GI tract you're looking at? Okay? Some cases it will help you, other cases it won't. Okay? And we'll worry about that when we talk about the different organs. But here in the mucosal tunic, this is going to be an area where you're going to see secretion of mucus in many cases. So you're going to see cells in the mucosal tunic that can secrete mucus. You may see cells that are going to be able to absorb material. So if this is an area where nutrients are getting absorbed, like in the small intestine, then you will have cells there that can do that absorption. And you're going to see a lot of lymphatic tissue <clears throat> in the mucosal tunic, some areas more than others. But that tissue is helping to protect against pathogens that are entering into the food. When you look at the mucosal tunic, it's going to have different layers. The innermost layer is always going to be epithelia then you're going to have a connective tissue that the epithelia attaches to called the lamina propria. 
then you're going to see a really thin layer of smooth muscle cells called the muscularis mucosa. Now, these are not the smooth muscle cells that are setting up peristalsis or segmentation. To do peristalsis or segmentation, you need a lot of muscle cells. And those will actually be in a different tunic that we'll talk about later. So these are the three layers of the mucosal tunic, epithelia, lamina propria, connective tissue, loose connective tissue, and then a very thin layer of smooth muscle cells, muscularis mucosa. Now, the epithelial part of the mucosal tunic for the most part, when you're looking at the GI tract, most of the time that epithelia is going to be simple columnar epithelia. Now there will be exceptions. In the esophagus, where you have this big bolus of food, really rough food particles that haven't been mixed with a lot of liquid, still very rough, what kind of epithelia do you think would be in the esophagus? Stratified, stratified squamish. So that would be an adaptation. And if you see stratified squamish, then you know, hey, I might be looking at the esophagus. Where else in the GI tract would you see stratified squamish epithelia? In the anus, okay? Now, in the stomach, the small intestine, and most of the large intestine, it's going to be simple columnar epithelia because that's kind of the normal kind of epithelia in the GI system. Now, you're also going to see goblet cells embedded within that epithelia. And goblet cells are just a generic cell. We saw them in the respiratory tract as well. And they secrete mucus. So these mu mucosal secretions, they're going to help protect the digestive organs from enzymes that would eat the organ itself. And we're gonna see this is gonna be real important in the stomach. The stomach releases a lot of really harsh, nasty chemicals that if we didn't have protection, those chemicals not only would break down the food that's in the stomach, but would also break down the stomach wall itself. And that's what an ulcer is. So that mucus is gonna help to coat the innermost part of that epithelia or the mucosal tunic to help to protect it. That mucus is also going to help to ease the food along the passageway. So in the esophagus, that's going to be really helpful. Having mucus secreted into the lumen is going to help reduce the friction of that food moving through the esophagus. This will be important in the large intestine as well when we start to produce um, feces, when we start to get that hard fecal material again. In the stomach and in the small intestine, we're going to see that in the mucosa, you're going to see some extra things in there. You're going to see some enzyme secreting cells in the stomach and small intestine. And when we get to these organs, we'll define what these cells are and what they're actually secreting. But in addition to this, in the mucosal tunic, in the epithelial portion of the mucosal tunic, you'll also see what are called enteroendocrine cells. So these will be hormone secreting cells that you find in the stomach and in the small intestine. Now, the next part of the mucosal tunic is the lamina propria. And again, this is just connective tissue that the epithelia is attaching to. So this is going to be loose areolar or reticular connective tissue. It's going to help to nourish the epithelia because remember, epithelia is avascular, doesn't have its own blood supply. So those epithelial cells have to get their nutrients somewhere. And they're going to get the nutrients from the blood vessels that run through the lamina propria. We're also going to see that there'll be lymphatic tissue here in the lamina propria these little lymph nodes, and they're going to be important in helping to defend the body against things that enter in through our food. The next outermost layer of the mucosal tunic is the muscularis mucosa. Again, a very thin layer of smooth muscle cells. They're only going to be able to produce enough tension to cause movement of the cells here in the mucosal tunic. 
not enough force to cause peristalsis or segmentation. So these smooth muscle cells are just helping to move these cells here in the mucosal tunic if they need to be moved. Okay, now the next tunic, the second tunic, submucosa. This is going to be dense connective tissue. And in that dense connective tissue, you'll find a lot of blood vessels that are supplying the organ. You'll find a lot of lymphatic vessels. You'll find lymph nodes. You'll find a lot of nerves in the submucosa. In the muscularis externa, the third tunic, this is where you're going to see layers of smooth muscle cells. You're going to see at least two layers, sometimes three layers. And we'll talk about why two versus three later. And these are going to be the smooth muscle cells that set up segmentation or set up peristalsis. The outermost tunic is the serosa, or if we're talking about an intraperitoneal organ, it would be called the visceral peritoneal. So it's just the connective tissue that's surrounding that organ. Okay. And we're going to talk a lot about these tunics. We're going to show, I'm going to show you these different tunics. I'm going to show you how to identify one versus the other. So we'll get there. But we're going to be spending a lot of time talking about tunics. So when you're thinking about the digestive system, you want to be really comfortable with saying, what is special about the mucosal tunic in the stomach? What is special about the mucosal tunic in the small intestine? How do those adaptations allow those organs to do a particular job? How can I tell one from the other based on a slide? And it's you're going to be looking at those different tunics and saying, are they similar or are they different from one organ to another? So we'll get there. So we mentioned the enteric nervous system. Again, these are nerves that are in the GI tract itself. They don't have to be linked to the central nervous system. They can be. And so we'll look at this in more detail later when we're talking about mechanisms. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to start at the mouth and we want to work our way down. And again, what we're going to focus on is what happens in this particular area and what allows those particular functions to occur. And when we're looking at the GI tract, we definitely want to keep in mind where do we break down our various nutrients. Where are we chemically digesting carbohydrates, fats, proteins? What are the enzymes that chemically digest those macromolecules? And then where are we absorbing the nutrients? So you definitely want to keep those things in mind. So in the mouth, or the buccal cavity, this is going to be the only part of the GI tract where ingestion occurs, right? This is the only place, hopefully, where you're putting the food into the GI tract, right? There's a good South Park episode where they did it at the opposite end. But generally speaking, in a normal situation, the mouth is the only place where ingestion occurs. Now, what's happening in the mouth is we're going to do a lot of mechanical digestion. We're going to start to break that food down, and we're going to do that with the help of the teeth. Now, we're also going to do chemical digestion. This is going to be the first place that we see chemical digestion happening. But we're not going to do a lot of chemical digestion. We're just going to barely start digesting carbohydrates, in particular starch. And we're going to do that with an enzyme called salivary amylase. Salivary amylase is an enzyme that breaks down starch. We're going to see it first being secreted from our salivary glands and breaking down starch in the mouth. And this is why you should slow down when you're eating. Take the time to mechanically digest this food. 
so that your stomach doesn't have to do all the work. Allow your teeth to mechanically digest, and then allow this chemical digestion to start. Allow your body to start digesting these starches. Now, when you... Uh -huh. I was just going to say, could you write that down? Yeah, it's on the, uh, it's on the next oh, slide. Oh, okay, sorry. It's actually in these notes many times, but celebrate in place. Is that A M? A M Y L A S E. Yeah, and it's in the slides several times. So, if you were to take a piece of bread that has a lot of starch in it, and if you kept it in your mouth for a while and chewed it and allowed a lot of saliva to mix with it, and in that saliva would be salivary amylase. That's salivary amylase, this enzyme, ends in ASE, so you know it's an enzyme. Enzymes generally end in ASE, not ASE. <coughs> if you took the time to do that, that enzyme would start to break down that starch into individual glucose units. Now, you're not going to absorb any of those glucoses in your mouth. That doesn't happen there. But you can break the starch down. And those glucoses then can start to bind to sweet taste receptors. And that bread should start to taste really sweet if you chew it for a while. If you chew it really fast, you're not going to get those glucoses being released, and the bread's not going to taste sweet to you. But if you take the time and do it, it should taste sweet. Now, in the mouth, because you are dealing with a lot of abrasion, you're going to find stratified squamous epithelia lining the mouth. And it's probably going to be keratinized. Remember, keratin is a protein that's going to be on the most apical part of that epithelia, and it just helps to protect that epithelia even a little bit more. It makes it a little bit tougher, a little bit stronger. So in the mouth, we're going to do a lot of mechanical digestion. We're going to start chemical digestion with salivary amylase and breaking down carbohydrates or starch, and we're going to do propulsion. We're going to set up swallowing. <coughs> And swallowing, the first part of swallowing is going to be voluntary. You decide when you're going to propel that food that you just ingested. And then the second part of swallowing, once it gets down into the esophagus, then that will be involuntary. You won't have to think about it anymore. <clears throat> and then once that food gets down into the stomach, peristalsis will take over. And again, it's involuntary. You don't have to think about it. Accessory organs, T salivary glands, tongue. Now, these salivary glands, you want to look at some of them. We're going to look at the extrinsic glands. And you have pairs of these. So you have two parotid glands, two submandibular, two sublingual. And they're going to produce secretions. They are exocrine glands. So they're going to produce secretions, saliva that are going to help to cleanse the mouth. They're going to help to moisten and dissolve the food. And this is going to be important if you want to taste what you're eating. In order to activate taste receptors, you have to get these chemicals dissolved in the saliva, and then they can bond to the receptors. If there's no saliva, and you can't get these chemicals dissolved, then you're not going to be able to taste it. Okay, so that's real important. It's going to help to form a bolus, so it's going to help to pack all this chewed food together and form a bolus that we can then move or propel. And we've got enzymes that are going to break down starch, salivary enzymes. When you look at your glands, so your parotids are right here, they're real nice big glands, right in just anterior to your ear. Your sublingual glands are underneath your tongue. Your submandibular are underneath your mandible. And again, you have pairs of these. Now, for these salivary glands, again, they're producing saliva. So what is saliva? 
most of the saliva is water. So the majority of it, 99.5% is water. And then in that water, things are going to be dissolved in it. So you're going to have a variety of electrolytes. And I'm not going to ask you to name the specific electrolytes. But you should know there's electrolytes dissolved in it. There are enzymes, two enzymes in the saliva. One we just mentioned, salivary amylase. That enzyme released in saliva and is active in the mouth. So with all these enzymes, you're going to want to know where they're released, where they are active, and what they break down. So salivary amylase released in the saliva, active in the mouth, breaks down starch into glucose. So it breaks down carbohydrates. The other one that you see in the saliva is called lingual lipase. And what do you think this breaks down? It breaks down fats, but it's not going to be active in the mouth. It's released in the mouth, but it's not going to be active until we get to the small intestine. So it's just going to travel with all this food that we've ingested. It's just going to travel with all these juices until it gets down to the small intestine. And then when it mixes with other things, then it will become active. Okay, so lingual lipase released from the salivary glands, not active until we hit the small intestine. But once it is active, it will break down the lipids. Is there a <coughs> chart online like there was for the hormones? The there bed? is, at the, I think at the end of this lecture, there's kind of a summary. Oh, okay. It's not, it, there's not an Excel spreadsheet per se, but there should be a. It should be a summary of kind of what's happening in every organ. Mm -hmm. We're not going to talk about that many enzymes, so it won't be that difficult to make a little list. There are other things in the saliva, a variety of proteins, and a lot of these proteins are going to ha help in defending you against things that you take in through the mouth. So some of these proteins will act as antibiotics, some will act as cytokines, which are chemicals that draw other white bloods or white blood cells to the area. So helping with defense. You'll see some metabolic waste that are in the saliva, and you'll see some bacteria here. Now, in the mouth, you always have some bacteria in the mouth. And <coughs> there are certain bacteria that you want in the mouth because they are friendly bacteria. And what they do is they set up an environment, basically they set up at a slightly acidic environment, not real acidic, just slightly acidic, because of the various um, chemical reactions that they're undergoing, they're going to release byproducts that are acidic. And those acidic byproducts set up an environment that helps to keep unwanted bacteria from flourishing in the mouth. Now, if you aren't producing a lot of saliva and you can't cleanse the mouth, then what can happen is these other bacteria that you really don't want in the mouth, they can start dividing and kind of building up in the mouth. And that's where you can get things like halitosis, you can get bad breath from the various byproducts that these bacteria are releasing. So having saliva, having a certain amount being produced is actually a good thing. It keeps to cleanse the mouth, it keeps these other bacteria at bay a bit. Now, how do we get saliva being produced? You produce a lot of saliva a day. You're producing about a liter of saliva, so about a thousand mils or so. So if you think how big a liter is, so a liter's about that tall and about mm, that round, okay? So it's a lot of saliva you're producing in a day. And again, that's a good thing. You want that to happen. And it's going to be driven by parasympathetic stimulation. So you're going to have, um, when you ingest food, 
you're going to have various receptors that start to get activated. You'll have different chemoreceptors that are in your mouth that get activated, and you'll have mechanoreceptors. So as food goes in your mouth and stretches your mouth, mechanoreceptors will get activated. And so these receptors then will send information up to the brain, in particular, up to the medulla and the pons, up to the brain stem, and up there, there's a salivary center that's receiving this information. That salivary center will process this information and coming out of the salivary center and down to the salivary glands are parasympathetic neurons. And they'll start firing and they'll cause the salivary glands to start producing saliva. Now, thinking about food can also trigger this. So thinking about food, that kind of um, neuronal activity would be happening where? If you're just sitting here thinking about food, what areas of your brain are active? I think. Mm, thinking about food, conscious thought in the cerebrum, right? So lots of different areas of the cerebrum, depending on if you're thinking about how does food look or how does food smell or how does food taste, different parts of the cerebrum will be active. And the cerebrum is also sending inputs down to the salivary center. So thinking about food can send information down to the salivary center, cause the salivary center to become more active, parasympathetic activity increases out to the salivary glands, and you start salivating. So you don't have to have food in your mouth to trigger that. You can think about it. You can smell food, right? You can see it. Anything that has to do with food can trigger that center. And you see this with your dog, right? You, you know, hit his food <laughs> bowl and all of a sudden, you know, he's salivating. And that's because of this right here. Now, sympathetic stimulation is going to inhibit this activity. And if you've ever had to give a talk in front of a bunch of people and you're not real comfortable doing that, you know that your mouth will dry up really bad. And it makes it hard to talk and you don't form your words correctly. And being under a lot of stress can trigger this. And this can lead to halitosis. It can lead to your mouth being dry. And so, even for me, I don't get nervous talking in front of people, but one of the reasons I chew gum is it keeps the saliva being produced and that keeps my mouth from getting really dry. So sympathetic stimulation is going to inhibit this activity. Um, when you take, because uh, a lot of times on TV or whatnot, you'll hear ads for medicines and it says that like one of the side effects is dry mouth. Wait, uh, what? Like if you take a if you take some sort of medicine mm -hmm. and one of the side effects is dry mouth. Mm -hmm. Are I know there's probably a lot of different ways they can work, but does it just inhibit the paris? How what would cause like what would they work on? Do you it could be any lots idea? of things. So it, you don't have to be if you take a drug that specifically inhibits the parasympathetic system, that would obviously cause this. Usually what people are doing is they are taking medication that is activating the sympathetic for whatever reason. And if you activate the sympathetic and cause it to be more active than the base parasympathetic, this can happen. A lot of people that do get really nervous speaking in front of people, a lot of times people will take um, beta blockers. So they'll take beta blockers that are keeping their heart rate from being too high, basically inhibiting sympathetic stimulation. And if you inhibit sympathetic stimulation, then the parasympathetic will be more active. <coughs> so you can kind of counter it that way as well. But really, any medication that is working on the autonomic nervous system that's either inhibiting para or activating sympa, then it can cause drug mouth. Thanks. OK. Now, Halitosis, and I'm going to talk a lot about. I put this up here just to give you the gross factor. Okay, so I'm not going to test you on it or anything like that. But again, what's happening with halitosis is generally you're having a decrease in saliva production. 
And because, and that could be due to all kinds of situations. Could be medication, could be secondary disease states, lots of things can cause it. But if you do have decreased in saliva, then you're not cleansing your mouth. And so what you want to do in that situation is try to ramp up production, like chewing gum, or just drinking water to cleanse your mouth out. But if those bacteria can build up, then what happens is they're going to do their chemical reactions, which are a lot of anaerobic type processes, making ATP without oxygen, not using the mitochondria, just in the cytoplasm. And a lot of these byproducts, just like what we talked about with our skeletal muscles, when our skeletal muscles are doing anaerobic activity, one of the byproducts is lactic acid. For bacteria, they will have other kind of byproducts. But those byproducts that the bacteria are producing are the same byproducts that you find in rotten eggs, hydrogen sulfide, or the same byproducts that you find in fecal materials, or the same byproducts that you find with rotting corpses. So these very same chemicals are literally in your mouth. And that's how you can get really horrible bad breath. And again, the key to getting rid of this is to try to decrease the number of bacteria that are there in the mouth. Is that why they say to brush your tongue? Brush your tongue, yep, that'll definitely help. Mm -hmm. Anything you can do to get rid of those. So the rotting corpses, like, is that just like, part of your body? No, so it's your body's not decomposing. This chemical that's produced in rotting corpses is the same chemical that these bacteria are producing. So your body's not breaking down. The bacteria, when they do their chemical reactions, one of the byproducts of their chemical reactions is this compound. This is the same chemical that you find in rotting corpses. So your body's not breaking down, but it's the same chemical. Right? And it smells bad in both cases. <laughs> okay, so... Leave the mouth, go down to the pharynx. I'm not going to say a lot about the pharynx, except that there are three different parts to the pharynx. This should be reviewed for you guys. You've got the nasopharynx, which is not relevant here for the digestive tract. Second part is the oropharynx, straight back from your mouth. The very bottom part of your pharynx is the laryngeopharynx. And it's going to be here in the pharynx where food, we want food to go from the pharynx into the esophagus. And we want air to go from the pharynx into the larynx into the trachea. So the esophagus is going to sit just posterior to the trachea. And remember, it's the larynx. It's the epiglottis of the larynx that is going to close when we eat and that's going to force food to go from the pharynx into the esophagus. When we're breathing and not eating, the epiglottis of the larynx is open, and so air can go from the pharynx into the larynx into the trachea. It's also going to be lined with stratified squamous epithelia because that food is still very abrasive. Has it mixed with a lot of fluids yet? A little bit of saliva, but it's still very harsh. When you look at the muscles in the wall of the pharynx, they're going to be skeletal muscle, and I'm not going to ask you about the orientation of those muscles, but these skeletal muscles are going to allow you to have voluntary control over that first part of scroll. So food's going to go mouth, pharynx, and then into the esophagus. And it's here in the esophagus from the esophagus all the way down to the anus where we're gonna see four continuous tunics. This is where it starts in the esophagus. Now the esophagus is basically just a tube. It's a muscular tube that is running through the mediastinum. Remember that's this area here behind the sternum and it's connecting the bottom part of the pharynx to the stomach. And this esophagus has to go through the diaphragm. 
So remember the diaphragm, this big respiratory muscle that is dividing the thoracic and abdominal cavities. There literally is a hole right in the diaphragm and the esophagus runs through that hole. Now, where the esophagus joins up with the stomach, there's gonna be a sphincter right there. So the esophagus goes through the diaphragm and just under the diaphragm, that's where it's gonna link up to the stomach. And there's a sphincter right there called the cardiac sphincter. Or it's also referred to as the lower esophageal sphincter. We'll get to that here in a second. Now, in the esophagus, again, we're gonna see all four tunics very distinct. The mucosal tunic, it's gonna have stratified squamous epithelia. And again, this is gonna help you know that you're in the esophagus. If you see stratified squamous epithelia, and you know you have four defined tunics, that you know that you're either in the esophagus or you're in the anus, but you cannot be in the stomach, the small intestine, or most of the large intestine that will be simple cuboidal epithelia. In the submucosa, you're gonna find a lot of esophageal glands that are producing mucus to help that food travel through the esophagus. In the muscularis external layer, most of the time in the GI tract, you're gonna see smooth muscle in that particular tunic. The esophagus is gonna be unique and that the top third of this tunic is going to be skeletal muscle, the middle third is going to be mixed, and the bottom third is smooth muscle. So what this is telling you is here in the esophagus is where we're making that switch between voluntary control over propulsion and involuntary control. Once you get past the top part of the esophagus, you're not gonna have control anymore over propulsion of this material. It's all gonna be driven by smooth muscle, involuntary control. The outermost part is gonna just be connective tissue. Okay, fibers connective tissue. Now, the esophagus is one slide that you're gonna to have to be familiar with. And this is a good slide to start looking at how do you tell what tunic you're looking at. So what we're looking at here, when you're looking at an organ, the first thing that you want to do is get a sense of where is the lumen. So right here, what we're looking at is, we're looking at a transverse or a horizontal cut of the esophagus. So it's cut like that, and so you're looking down through it. So in here would be the lumen. Some of the slides that you're looking at, you may just be looking at half of the organ. So the lumen might be, let's say, here, and then you've got the mucosal tunic, submucosa, muscularis externa, serosa. So you might just be looking at half. But here we're looking at the whole thing, cross section like that. So again, first thing that I wanna do is I wanna see where is the lumen, and the way I'm gonna know where the lumen is is that's where the epithelia is going to be located. And then the other edge is going to be the serosa, or the dense connective tissue. So out here, this dense connective tissue out here, the white this is out here. It's kind of lighter purple out here, kind of, kind of clear, because again, in that connective tissue, there aren't a lot of cells, a lot of extracellular protein fibers. So it'll often have kind of a stringy appearance to it, but there aren't gonna be a lot of cells in there, so it's not gonna stain dark. When you look at the lumen and look at the epithelia that lines the lumen, that should stain really darkly because that's epithelial cells packed tightly together and all those nuclei should stain really bright. So, when I look here, this area that's stained dark, that's the epithelial layer, and that's gonna be in the mucosal tunic. Then the next tunic would be the submucosa, 
and the submucosa is going to be mostly connective tissue. So it should stain lighter. Again, connective tissue should stain lighter because you have cells scattered in a matrix or not close together. So you can see this difference in color. It goes darker and then lighter. So mucosal tunic, submucosa in here, and then you're going to go to muscularis externa. And for the most part, when you look at muscularis externa, you're going to see two layers of smooth muscle cells. You're going to see a circular layer and then out, out from that a longitudinal layer. And that's what you see here. Here's your circular layer of smooth muscle cells of muscularis externa. And then here's your longitudinal layer of smooth muscle cells in muscularis externa. And your smooth muscle cells should stain darker because, again, the cells are kind of lined up on one another. So mucosa, kind of darkish, submucosa, lighter, muscularis externa, darker, serosa should be pretty light, pretty thin layer. Now again, it's a little hard here because we can't magnify it. If we could magnify this, we would be able to see the smooth muscle cells in here. We'd be able to see the epithelial cells. So, you know, you're going to start at one layer or one objective and just kind of see, can I see color changes? And then increase the magnification to start looking at cells and how they're oriented. So again, for the muscularis externa, you're going to see a circular layer and then a longitudinal layer. And what that means is the smooth muscle cells are either going around like this or they're coming in this direction, like that. That's what you're seeing here. If we take this mucosal tunic and expand it, then this is what we're looking at right here. And again, you can see here is your stratified squamous epithelia right there. And then this would be your lamina propria down here. And I can't really see muscularis mucosa. But for the different tunics, I'm not going to ask you to identify the different layers of the tunics, except for the epithelial layer you should be able to see in the mucosal tunic. But I'm not going to ask you, I'm not going to point to lamina propria of the mucosal tunic. I'm not going to point to muscularis mucosa of the mucosal tunic. Okay, but you should definitely be able to see these four tunics in every slide that you look at, and you should be able to identify the epithelia in every slide that you look at, and then whatever is special in that slide to help you know, is it this organ versus that organ? Okay, questions on that? And again, it's practice. It seems daunting right now, but once you go through it a few times, it's not so bad. And on Thursday, you know, we'll go through and say, this is how you know you're looking at the stomach. This is what you're looking for. This is what you're looking at in the small intestine, and so on and so forth. For the esophagus, what you're looking at is you want to see distinct more tunics. Should be very easy to see. You want to see stratified squamous epithelia, and you want to see um, you know, your muscularis externa, you should see two distinct layers there. Okay, now, I mentioned heartburn because so many people experience <coughs> it, and basically what heartburn is, is it's juices that are in the stomach, so those are called gastric juices. Anything to do with the stomach is gastro whatever. The stomach is going to be an environment that is very harsh. Um, when you look at the pH in the stomach, it's going to be very low, like around a pH of 2. Uh, and we'll talk about why that's necessary. Most of the time when you look at the body, the pH is going to be right around 7 or so. But in the stomach, it's very, very acidic. And so what can happen is if 
a, a lot of different things can cause this. So obesity, pregnancy, running, having problems um, with the sphincter between the esophagus and the stomach, um, which again is called your cardiac sphincter. If you have a problem with that sphincter, a structural abnormality that gives you a hiatal hernia. Any of these things can cause heartburn. And what it is is those juices that should stay in the stomach, they're able to go past this cardiac sphincter and into the esophagus. And those really harsh juices start to burn, literally start to break down the uh, epithelia, start to break down the wall of the esophagus. And it starts to activate pain receptors in the process. And that's where that pain comes from. Now, just because you have heartburn does not mean that you have a hiatal hernia. If you wear your jeans too tight and you're squeezing on the stomach, that can cause gastric juices to go back up into the esophagus. If you eat a big meal and your stomach is really expanded, and particularly if you start running and jostling all those juices, or if you lay down horizontal and allow those juices to kind of flow back up, that can cause heartburn. So just because you have um, heartburn does not mean you have a hiatal hernia. But if you have a hiatal hernia, you are pretty much going to have heartburn be a major symptom, big problem. Now, just to summarize what we've done so far. Okay? So food's ingested in the mouth. Mechanical digestion begins in the mouth. Propulsion starts in the mouth via swallowing. Salivary amylase is going to start to break down starch. It's not going to completely break it down, but it's going to start to break down starch into glucose. Lingual lipase is released from the glands, salivary glands, released in the mouth, but is not active for the most part. And we're just going to say across the board until we get to the small intestine. No absorption takes place in the mouth. We're not absorbing any nutrients. Now, some drugs you can put under your tongue, and they can be absorbed sublingually. And that's because you have really big blood vessels right under your tongue. But no nutrients are absorbed there. No vitamins, no uh, monosaccharides, no amino acids, no fatty acid, glycerol, none of that. Pharynx and esophagus are basically just passageways to get to the stomach. No digestion is taking place in these particular structures. Um, no major secretions are being released except maybe some mucus. They're just passageways to get to the stomach. Now that we're in the stomach, actually swallowing, I'm going to skip this just to save some time. We'll just skip swallowing. Let's get to the stomach. Stomach is where we're going to see some major activities taking place. <coughs> so, first of all, in the stomach is where we are going to begin to break down proteins. So, we began breaking down starches, carbohydrates in the mouth. We're going to begin to break down proteins in the stomach. And that's the only thing that gets broken down in the stomach. No carbohydrate digestion takes place here. So any of that salivary amylase that makes it down to the stomach, it's not going to be active down there because the pH changes drastically. And that change in pH, even though that salivary amylase is still there, maybe still be there, it's not going to be active. Okay? The pH is too different. The only kind of activity, chemical digestion that takes place is we're going to start to break down proteins. No absorption is going to take place here, though. We're going to start to break down proteins. Now, when you look at the stomach, when the stomach is collapsed, so the wall will do these folds, again, called rugae, you're going to have longitudinal folds of the mucosa and submucosal tunic. And that, called rugae, collapses when the stomach is empty. When you start to put food in the stomach, those folds can expand. 
And so the stomach can go from basically having a volume of 50 mils, which is not that much, up to about <coughs> four liters or a gallon. So you could put four liters of material in the stomach, right? Obviously you don't want to do that. It's not a good idea for <laughs> many reasons, but it will expand greatly. Okay. Now, when you look at the stomach, it's going to have different regions to it. So let's get this up here. Okay. So first of all, up here's where the esophagus is coming down and meeting with the stomach. Right above that would be the diaphragm. We're going to have, when you look at the stomach, the different parts of the stomach, this part right here where it meets up with the esophagus, that's called the cardiac region. Then the most superior kind of uh, <coughs> curve to the stomach, that's called the fundus. So where the esophagus meets up, that's the cardiac region or the cardia. That bulge there, superior bulge, is the fundus. The bulk of the stomach is called the body. And then down here where it meets up with the first part of the small intestine, which is called the duodenum, or you'll also see it called the duodenum. Either is fine. I always call it duodenum, but either is fine. Where the stomach meets up with the first part of the small intestine, the duodenum, this is called the pyloric region. So you've got the cardia, the fundus, the majority of it is the body, and then the pyloric region. You have two valves. Again, you want to keep material in the stomach until it's ready to move forward. You don't want material to go backward. You've got the cardiac sphincter or cardiac valve between the esophagus and the cardiac region of the stomach cardiac sphincter, or it's also called the lower esophageal sphincter. Either one's fine. Down here, between the pyloric region of the stomach and the first part of the small intestine and duodenum, you have the pyloric sphincter, or pyloric valve. Now, when you look at the stomach, in terms of gross anatomy, <coughs> you're going to see two major curves. You've got this large curve here called the greater curvature, and then you have this smaller curve here called the lesser curvature. Now those curves are important because you're going to see mesentery coming off of each of those curvatures. Now remember what mesentery is. It's a double layer of the peritoneum. So it's connective tissue, serous membrane, that's flipped on itself. And in the mesentery, you're going to find blood vessels running through the mesentery, routing to the various organs. You're going to find nerves in that mesentery being routed to the various organs. You're going to find a lot of lymphatic tissue in those mesentery to help protect all these organs in here. And the main job of that mesentery is to connect the different organs together. So, from the lesser curvature, just make sure I covered everything in here, <coughs> we're good. So the lesser yeah. curvature is mesen, or sorry, coming off of the lesser curvature is mesentery called the lesser omentum. Omentum is just a fancy word for mesentery. Mesentery is a fancy word for double layer peritoneum. Okay. Again, basically it's just connective tissue that connects things together. The lesser omentum goes from the lesser curvature of the stomach to the liver. It's connecting the stomach to the liver. The greater curvature, you're going to find the greater omentum off of this and it's the greater omentum is connecting the greater curvature of the stomach to part of the small intestine. Again it's helping to hold these different parts of the GI tract together. Now up in the lab just like every model we've seen so far you're not going to see the mesentery on the models so you should just know what it is, and it's going from there to there type of thing. Okay. And you're not going to see connective tissue on the models for the most part. So. 
Now, when you look inside the stomach, again, the stomach's not going to be smooth inside. You're going to see these folds, these longitudinal folds. And this is the mucosa and submucosal tunic. Instead of them being mucosal tunic, then submucosa, those two tunics are going to go like this. And that sets up this rugae, kind of like an accordion. So if we start putting food in there, the stomach can start to expand nice and large. Now, what we want to do is we want to say, okay, what's special about the different tunics that allows the stomach to do particular jobs? And one of the major jobs of the stomach is to break down proteins, start to break down proteins. Now, one thing, one adaptation that we're going to see is the muscularis externa. Right? Muscularis externa is the third tunic out. Right? You've got mucosal, submucosal, muscularis externa. We said that for most of the GI tract in muscularis externa, you've got two layers of smooth muscle cells. We saw a circular layer and we saw a longitudinal layer. In the stomach, we're going to have three layers. We're going to have a circular layer, a longitudinal layer, and then a third oblique layer that are all muscularis externa. And what that's going to do for the stomach is it's going to allow the stomach to be able to do segmentation really well. So what we want when we get to the stomach we want to finish mechanical digestion in the stomach so that by the time material leaves the stomach and goes to the small intestine, it's in really tiny pieces because in the small intestine is where we're going to finish chemical digestion and then do all of our absorption. So in the stomach, we want to finish all mechanical digestion, get started on finish all mechanical digestion, get started on protein chemical digestion, and make sure our particles are really small so that when we get to the small intestine, we can finish chemical digestion. So that means the stomach has to do a lot of mixing, churning, pummeling of that material, and adding that third layer of smooth muscle cells in muscularis externa allows us to do that really well. So again, structure dictates function. We're going to have three layers, circular layer, then a longitudinal, then an oblique layer. And that is one way to help you identify, hey, I'm looking in the stomach. You have three layers of smooth muscle cells. Now, when you look at the mucosal tunic, lots of adaptations are going to be in the mucosal tunic as well because in the stomach we're going to be releasing a lot of digestive juices, some digestive enzymes, and all, a lot of that's going to happen here in the mucosal tunic. Now, because the stomach is releasing some really harsh acids, hydrogen chloride, and we're going to be releasing enzymes that break down proteins, one major thing that we're going to have to deal with in the stomach is we have to protect the stomach against the own secretions that it's releasing. And so there's going to be a variety of adaptations that allow that to happen. So one thing that we're going to see, first of all, the mucosal tunic is going to have the epithelial layer. We're going to be see simple columnar epithelial cells which is not super special. That's not going to help us determine stomach versus small intestine versus large intestine. But we will see a lot of goblet cells embedded in the epithelia, which again is not necessarily going to help us narrow things down. But those goblet cells are producing mucus. Now, the mucus that's being released, we're going to release some mucus that's going to line the innermost part of the stomach. And that's going to just help to put a barrier on the, um, on the stomach so that things can't get past that barrier. 
then we're also going to secrete this bicarbonate rich or alkaline rich fluid that's going to sit kind of right underneath the epithelia. So that, so this slide here. Actually, I'll come, I'll come back to that here in just a second. Let's finish defining what the epithelia looks like, and then I'll come back and talk about this. Now, the rest of the mucosa, so it's going to be simple columnar epithelia, goblet cells embedded in it. The rest of the mucosa is going to have millions of what are called gastric pits. And at the ends of these gastric pits are going to be gastric glands. And cells in these gastric glands are going to secrete gastric juice, gastric mucus, and hormones. <coughs> One that we're going to talk about is gastrin. This is a hormone. Now, what that looks like is like this. And this is going to help you define that you're looking in the stomach is by looking for gastric pits. So, if you're looking here, this would be the lumen up here. And what you're going to see is you're going to see millions of these pits. And if you would travel down one of those pits, at the end of it, you're going to see glands that are releasing a variety of secretions that are traveling through the pits and then going here in the lumen to interact with the food. So if we cross-section one of these pits and look at it, what we see here is we've got our simple columnar epithelia, and it's just organized, instead of being straight, it's organized into this pit here. And then at the bottom of this pit, so this would be the pit right here, at the bottom of the pit is this gastric gland. This is an end, I should say that, this gastric gland. And in this gland are a bunch of cells and these cells are secreting different things. And we're going to look at some of these cells and some of their secretions. And then we would see that, so this would be the epithelial aspect of the mucosal tunic. And the epithelia just tends to be organized into pits and glands. Okay, that's an adaptation of the stomach. Then we would see the connective tissue underneath the lamina propria. Then we would see this thin layer of smooth muscle cells, the muscularis mucosa. And again, I would just ask you to identify that as the mucosal tumor. Then you're going to see the submucosa. Then you're going to see muscularis externa. And you're going to see an oblique layer, circular layer, longitudinal layer. And then you've got the serosa. And that's the wall of the stomach. Now, embedded, we said, within this simple columnar epithelia are going to be goblet cells. And those goblet cells are going to secrete mucus that's going to come out here and coat that surface. Now, we're also going to secrete mucus that's going to sit down like this. So we're going to secrete mucus that's going to line the lumen of the stomach, but then we're also going to secrete this alkaline or bicarbonate rich mucus that's going to sit like this. So that if any of these juices that we release, if they get past that surface layer of mucus and they start to come in between these cells or break down those cells, <laughs> when that acid gets right here, hopefully that bicarbonate rich mucus will neutralize that acid so that it can't keep going deeper and putting a nice big hole in the stomach. Because if that acid can keep getting down, 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 and those enzymes that break down proteins are getting deeper and deeper into the wall, you're going to put a great big hole in the stomach, and you don't want that. So lots of adaptations to keep that from happening. One, surface mucus. Next, bicarbonate-rich mucus in the, just below the epithelia. Now, what we want to do is we want to say, what cells are here in this gastric gland? Now, in terms of histology, I want you to know 
these different cells and what they release. But I'm not going to ask you to identify a parietal cell from a chief cell. I'm not going to ask you to do that based on histology. But you should be able to identify a gastric pit. When you look under the microscope, you should see, when you look at the stomach, that the epithelial cells are going like this. Right? So if you would look, these would be epithelial cells. down here, that, that's what the stomach's going to look like. Whereas when you look at the small intestine, the small intestine has villi, finger-like projections that go up like this. And we'll get there, we'll talk about that later, but this would be epithelial cells going like this. So that's going to be one huge way, gastric pits, so that would be your pit, that tells you you're in the stomach, intestinal villi tells you that you're looking in the small intestine. Again, we'll do that on Thursday. But for right now, different cells that I want you to know here in the gastric gland. Mucosal neck cells, they're secreting mucus. They're secreting an acidic mucus that's going to mix with all these gastric juices and mix with the food in there. Parietal cells. Parietal cells are secreting hydrochloric acid. Secrete hydrochloric acid, and they also secrete intrinsic factor. That intrinsic factor is not going to do anything at this point. It's going to be released, but intrinsic factor is not going to be active until we get down to the small intestine. And at the small intestine, intrinsic factor is going to aid in the absorption of your B vitamins. If you don't have intrinsic factor, then you can't absorb your B vitamins, particularly B12. And your B vitamins are involved in things like protein synthesis, particularly for red blood cell production. So if you have a problem with your stomach and your parietal cells get damaged and they're not secreting intrinsic factor, then you're going to have a problem absorbing B12 and you may become anemic. You can't make red blood cells as well because remember in red blood cells, what's the protein that's inside of them? Hemoglobin. So parietal cells secrete hydrochloric acid and intrinsic factor. Chief cells secrete pepsinogen. Now, what is pepsinogen? Pepsinogen is referred to as a proenzyme. It is an, it will become an enzyme, but it's not yet an enzyme. So pepsinogen released by the chief cells. When pepsinogen is in the presence of hydrochloric acid, or I should say when it's in the presence of an acidic environment, like hydrochloric acid sets up, which is released from the parietal cells. When pepsinogen's in the presence of HCl, then it gets converted into pepsin. And pepsin is your active enzyme. And what pepsin is going to do, it's going to begin chemical digestion of protein. So in the stomach, remember what proteins look like, right? Proteins are complex 3D structures. And the very first thing to breaking down a protein is you have to take that complex 3D structure and you have to unravel it or denature it. And one way that you're going to denature it 
is stick it in a real acidic environment, change the pH, and that will take that complex structure and unravel it. And now that it's unraveled, this enzyme can get in there and start cleaving those peptide bonds that are holding the individual amino acids together. And so pepsin is going to take these big proteins and start to break them down into smaller strings of amino acids called peptides. And maybe it even will cleave some actual amino acids. It's going to start to break down these big proteins. Now, this right here sets up a positive feedback loop where when pepsin is produced, pepsin then will stimulate chief cells to produce more pepsinogen. And it will stimulate the parietal cells to produce more HCL. And the more pepsinogen and the more HCL that's present, the more pepsin that's produced. And the more pepsin that's produced, then chief cells get activated to produce more pepsinogen, and parietal cells get activated to produce more HCL, and that forms more pepsin and you get this positive <coughs> feedback loop that gets set up. So as long as you have pepsin there in the stomach, you can ge keep getting more pepsinogen and HCL being produced, which produces more pepsin, and the whole thing keeps cycling. And the more pepsin you have, the more that you can keep breaking down your proteins. So it's a positive loop. Now, also in those gastric glands, you're going to have enteroendocrine cells. Cells, enterodigestive digestive cells, endocrine secrete hormones. So in the gastric glands, you will have enteroendocrine cells, cells that can release hormones. And there are a variety of hormones that are released from the stomach. And I'm going to ask you to only know one of them. The one that I want you to know is gastrin. And gastrin is released from a particular enteroendocrine cell called a G cell. So in the stomach, the cells that I want you to know of the gastric glands, <coughs> I want you to know that mucosal neck cells secrete an acidic mucus. Parietal cells secrete hydrochloric acid and intrinsic factor. And I want you to know what those are used for. Chief cells make pepsinogen. Pepsinogen in the presence of HCL gets converted into pepsin. This is an enzyme that breaks down proteins. And it's only active in the stomach because it's only active at a pH of two or less. So as soon as all this material, as soon as all this chyme moves into the small intestine and we neutralize the pH, pepsin will no longer be active. It's only active at a very low pH. And again, this low pH is why salivary amylase is not active here. It's why we're not breaking down carbohydrates. G cells secrete gastric. Now again, this is a very acidic environment. So that means that the stomach has to have adaptations so we don't form holes in the stomach. So when you look at the hydrogen ion concentration, remember that's an indicator of pH. It is about 100,000 times greater in the stomach when you've got food in the stomach, then what's in your blood. So it's very, very acidic. So you've got the HCL could eat a hole in the wall of the stomach. You've got pepsin can break down proteins that are in your cells that are lining the stomach. So you've got barriers that keep the stomach from having an ulcer. And some of those protective mechanisms. We already said that you're going to have this thick coat of bicarbonate-rich or alkaline mucus that is going to um, line the stomach. When you look at these cells, we mentioned this last quarter, 
when you look at these cells here, they are going to be linked together by tight junctions. Remember, tight junctions are just proteins and uh, proteoglycans, lipids, that are in the adjacent plasma membranes, and they hold those cells really tightly together. So that if any acid did come right back down into this pit, it wouldn't be able to go through those cells. There would be a link there, keeping that acid from kind of seeping between the cells or seeping down through these cells like this. So we've got this mucus barrier, we've got tight junctions, and then we've got the gastric glands. These cells that are making up the gastric glands, they are impermeable to HCL. So remember, HCL, when you put HCL in water, 